Hello, welcome to week two. Um, the point of this PowerPoint, brief PowerPoint, is just to go over a few things um, for you to think about when you're composing your, your first uh, assignment papers for this week, which again are focusing on the poems that we read for last week and thinking about how to incorporate some of the vocabulary we've been using um, or trying to practice with talking about poetry. Uh, again, some of those terms are here. I really want to focus on meter because um, while I, I was impressed with everyone's posts for this last week, I think there is more conversation to be had about not just what the poems are saying, but how the poets are actually saying what they're saying. Um, and I think this paper can be an opportunity for people to create more dialogue between what the poem is saying and also how the poet is saying it. And meter is a good way to do that. So again, your book defines meter. Um, it talks about meter as something that suggests certain patterns that invite expectations that may or may not be satisfied. And what meter refers to is um, the pattern of stressed and unstressed syllables. Um, and there's a few a few ways of naming this. So an I am is when you have a line of verse that goes unstressed, stressed over and over again, um, right? A trochee is stressed and unstressed. A dactyl is stressed, unstressed, unstressed. And an anapest is unstressed, unstressed, stressed. So to give you an example, um, when we say something is in iambic pentameter, what that means is that there are five uh, iams in the line of verse, and right, and this is what Shakespeare writes in. So, um, in a line from Romeo and Juliet, but soft, what light from yonder window breaks? Iambic pentameter. Um, you can see the unstressed, stressed pattern sort of working throughout this line, and in stopping by woods on a snowy evening. Uh, by Robert Frost. He also uses IMs, but he only includes four feet in his line, so it's iambic tetrameter. Um, so if you look at this, whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village, though. He will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. Um, right, really catchy, <laughs> catchy meter here. Um, but what I want to point out is that to me, this meter, especially in this poem, really emulates the sound of a, a horse sort of clip-clopping through the through the woods. You can almost hear the horse moving, right? Whose woods these are, I think, I know. His house is in the village, though. But then there's that kind of um, dropping off, right? We get the, the stressed, unstressed, unstressed in village, though. Um, which, to me, it always sounds like a book sort of falling off of a shelf, I think. But... I think what's interesting here is that we can sort of hear the horse stopping at that particular moment, right? His house is in the village, though. And then we can sort of hear that. Um, and then the next line tells us he will not see me stopping here, right? So it's almost like we know the horse has stopped before the speaker even tells us that he's stopped. Um, the poem continues, right? My little horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near between the woods and frozen lake, the darkest evening of the year. Now, I know some of you guys wrote about this uh, poem for this week, and I'm not sure if anybody proposed this idea, which is maybe one reason I wanted to talk about it. Um, but I'm wondering what's actually going on here. Is this poem just about a person in the woods um, stopping to watch the snow fill up the woods? Or is something else, does he have a, some, some other kind of intention here? My question is, is our speaker about to commit suicide? Why, why is he actually stopping? Um, and why do we have to consider what his horse is thinking at this moment, right? My horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near. My horse must be raising questions here. Um, but that line, the darkest evening of the year, I feel it can be read in a few different ways. Um, so I just want to throw that out there for a second. Uh, the next stanza, he says, he gives his harness bells a shake, again, talking about the horse, 
to ask if there is some mistake. The only other sounds the sweep of easy wind and downy flake. Um, again, this sort of concentration on the horse, uh, as if the horse is trying to say something just through being a horse. Um, the woods are lovely, dark and deep, but I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep and miles to go before I sleep. And what I'm wondering here is, again, thinking about what the intention here of stopping is, I think it could be argued perfectly, perfectly well that this is a poem just about a person stopping to enjoy nature, to take it all in. But I'm also wondering if there's something more sinister. Does sleep equal death here? Is that what the, the, the end of this poem means? Um, how is this story the narrative of this poem about something deeper? Is it an allegory? Is it a metaphor for something else? Um, and what I was really pleased with about your posts for this last week is that, um, is just the, the conversation and dialogue you all were having about how a poem could be read in more than one way. Um, and I think when you're, when you're coming up with your questions, um, when you're, when you're writing your papers this week, that's what I'd like you to keep in mind. Um, how can my text be interpreted in more than one way? And again, I'd really encourage you to return to your classmates' posts um, to have to get some help in thinking about how other people in the class are reading it. Um, but also, how can I address these counter arguments in my paper? Essentially, I think you can come up with an argument for this paper by taking those those other interpretations into consideration. Because the question you really want to answer. Um, in your thesis is why does my reading matter? What is at stake in reading the poem my way instead of the other? Why is my reading the correct reading? Um, so, for example, I could make an argument that uh, this poem, Stopping in Woods by on the Snowy Evening, is um, really about somebody wanting to commit suicide but um, not being able to go through with it. Um, and then I could sort of use the text to sort of support that argument and say that, that something more, more deeply metaphysical is going on in this poem than just a person stopping in the woods, right? So there's a lot more at stake than just watching sh snow fall. Um, so that's just what I want to throw out there. Um, I really look forward to reading your papers this week. Uh, and your posts as well. Um, please let me know if you have any questions, and good luck.